Matthias holds chairs in theoretical chemistry at the Re University of Amsterdam and uh, Rat Boat University, Nijmegen. And he is a head of the uh, VU Department of Chemistry and Pharmaceutical Sciences. Among others, he is the Dutch Research Council's VICI award winner, a member of the Royal Holland Society for Sciences and Humanities, and a Chemistry Europe Fellow. Uh, Matthias' research profile comprises four main directions of research that are intimately connected and reinforce each other. The first one, structure and chemical bonding in com sham density functional theory. The second, DNA replication. The third, elementary chemical reactions. And the fourth, rational fragment oriented catalyst design. Matthias work uh, has collected nearly 30,000 citations associated with an age index of 73. He started his own group uh, in 1997 as assistant professor habilitant in Marburg, Germany, and was offered a tenure at uh, VU Amsterdam in 1999. Uh, he held an, a European visiting uh, professorship at Warsaw University of Technology in 2013 was elected member of Royal Holland Society of Sciences and Humanities 2014, fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry 2014, member of Advanced Research Center Chemical Building Blocks Consortium 2016, and Chemistry Europe fellow, uh, fellow 2020. Among the academic offices uh, he holds are uh, funding chairman of the Royal Netherlands Society of Chemistry, the Division of Computational and Theoretical Chemistry, editorial board membership of various international journals, among which uh, Chemistry Europe, uh, chairman of the Holland uh, Research School of Molecular Chemistry, and a member of the Tafel Chemie Chemistry Board of the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research. Matthias, the screen is yours. Yes, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. can you see my screen? Okay, good. Uh, yes. Well, thank you, Paulina and Christoph, for uh, inviting me to this uh, renowned uh, lecture series. It's an honor. And uh, yeah, I will present um, yeah, a scientific story, which is about covalent interactions and intermolecular covalent interactions, and I will do that from a quantitative MO perspective. So it's an MO picture. Um, this is just a view on where I work. Uh, so you see the, the city center of Amsterdam. That's where I do not work, unfortunately. But we have a nice modern building now here in the lower part uh, left, um, where the chemistry department is located. And here you see the map where we are. So Amsterdam is here on the corner of the European uh, continent. Um, so uh, I have divided my presentation in a more, let's say, methodological part. Number one, activation strain model, MO model. And the issue or yeah, the, the question is, is a model a causal model? So the causality that we have in models. And um, so that maybe also connects with one of the questions to, uh, to Simon. Huh? So what is a good model? And uh, actually, I agree with uh, Simon that there is not one good model. There are different ones. But there are a certain, there are a number of conditions that I find important. I will come to that later on. Then I will go yeah, to the actual main topic at uh, the intermolecular covalent interactions, but I will compare them also to an example of conventional covalent interactions, just to show the differences and also the similarities. And I try to wrap up with a more general take home message. So let's go forward. First, the methodological part, which uh, we are developing here in Amsterdam together with uh, Celia von Sekegere, Pascal Vermeer and, and Trevor Hamlin. Um, 
And that is actually more general than we need it right now. Huh? So the activation strain model is actually yeah, an extension of the good old fragment approach, which was always used for yeah, stable molecules. And that is what I will use it for today. Yeah, but more in general, you can also ex use it to explain not only stability of uh, local minima, but also of saddle points, so activation energies. And they do not only depend on the interaction, the instantaneous interaction between two molecular fragments, but especially in reactions, they, de they strongly depend on the strain energy, so the deformation energy that is needed when the reactants or fragments distort during their interaction. And so if we look at a chemical reaction, so not the main topic of today, um, then we have, uh, for example, here, this is the energy as a function of a reaction coordinate. We start with the reactants, go up to the transition state and down to the products. And then we can say, well, um, if we want to understand the height of a barrier in terms of properties of the reactants, then we're actually asking when we bring together the reactants, what does it deliver when they interact, but also what does it cost when they deform? And they do deform, eh? and this, this is an oxidative addition reaction. Eh? So a metal center oxidatively adds and breaks a CX bond that is here in the transition state. You can see that it costs energy. Eh? So if we take the transition state, we would ask what did it cost to, part, to deform the original reactants? Well, that costs energy. Uh, bre breaking the CX bond, bending the transition metal complex, but we gain energy when they interact. And of course, that doesn't happen separately. It happens all at the same time. And so it's a conceptual thing to do. What did it cost to deform? How do these deformed reactants interact? And then finally go to the completion, to the products. And we can do that also along the reaction coordinates. So when we look here at the total energy profile. In every point, we can ask, what did it cost to deform the reactants? Then we have the strain curve. And we can ask at this point, how strongly do these deformed reactants interact? And this also holds for a stable molecule. Eh? So for transition states, you can now wonder, well, if I take a catalyst complex that is less capable to interact with a certain bond. Well, my bond that I break is still the same, and it's the main source of the strain of breaking the bond. Well, that will not change so much, but the catalyst interacts weaker and more weakly. So the strain curve plus the interaction curve will yield a total energy curve here in the middle that is higher for the red curve because the red interaction is less stabilizing for the less capable catalyst. Well, today we are actually going to look at situations where, well, the reaction is actually a bond formation reaction, very simple. So in these cases, the strain is so small that uh, it is there, it's not, not negligible, but it is too small to push up the total energy during the reaction um, to yield a transition state. So we go only in total energy down. Yeah, so there's not a barrier, it's just only going down because the strain is not so high. So, and then we can wonder, yeah, so let's say today we're looking at uh, covalent single bonds or at intermolecular interactions. Yeah, so two fragments combine, there's no barrier, there is strain, but it is small because when the molecules interact, yeah, for example, a hydrogen bond a Lewis base attaches to the hydrogen of, let's say, a water molecule, and the, the OH bond extends a little bit. It's, it's stretched, that costs energy. But these stretched, deformed uh, fragments, they can interact. We cannot wonder where does the stabilization come from? And that is where we use a molecular orbital perspective. So it's a one electron picture that makes use of the physical notion that we have nuclei with electron particles and most of the energy is actually quite well described in a one electron wave function 
Yeah, but of course, we need the electron correlation phenomenon um, because that very subtle small term is important in chemical context. And you can build that in, yeah, in an average way in cone sham density functional theory. I will also say a few words about that later. So we have an, well, in theory exact, but in practice, of course, an approximate but quite accurate one electron model. So when we have these two fragments, A and B, let's say a hydrogen bond donor and a hydrogen bond acceptor, and we start, yeah, then the picture could be we have an A and an B, and here for the purpose of my illustration, I give A and B a closed shell, a doubly occupied MO. And in this case, I will talk about an electron pair bond, but later on, we will only look at homo -lumo interactions or donor acceptor interactions, but this is more general. So open shell systems, that's, that's actually our con uh, concrete contribution to the EDA. We have introduced the open shell analysis here in Amsterdam. So this is the starting point, and what we physically associate that with is two fragments A and B at infinite separation. And what I'm going to do is I relieve in a stepwise manner all kinds of mathematical constraints that prevent the initial wave functions to adopt the converged correct final wave function. And, well, that's mathematical. It's all exact. So it's no extra uh, approximation on top of our approximate quantum chemical method. Uh, you could also do it for a full CI calculation. But within an MO model, what you see is that certain steps are associated with certain features in the electronic bonding mechanism. So we can now say physically, if we would have the original uh, molecular fragments, the charge distributions. I, we just bring them together, but do not allow any polarization or relaxation. What would they feel electrostatically? And if we do that, we go actually to the Hartree wave function or to the sum of densities of the original fragments. And what you see in the MO spectrum is that in 99% of the cases, just all the MOs go down in energy. They are stabilized. That is the MO picture of electrostatic interaction. And that happens because the charge clouds repel each other less of A and B than that each of the charge clouds A is stabilized by nuclei of B or charge cloud of B stabilized by nuclei of A. And that's just classical electrostatics. But the Hartree wave function or sum of density situation does not obey the Pauli principle yeah, that we need to have a correct fermionic wave function. Yeah? Psi A and Psi B, the fragment wave functions, they are correct, but Psi A times Psi B is not, that, that is the physical picture of bringing unperturbed charge distributions to each other, but that doesn't account for the quantum effect of fermions. So if we switch that Pauli principle on, we allow for it, which we of course have to do, then we see that for fermionic wave functions, we get a repulsive effect and we can define that wave function. And in an MO picture, we have switched on two orbital for electron repulsion or Pauli repulsion. We can also allow for the electron pair bonding configuration to be formed. And if we do that, we switch on electron pair bonding. And we can, of course, and for every step, we have a well-defined wave function. You can always say, are there other ways to do that? Yes, of course, there's an infinite number of ways you can do. You have totally different bonding models. This is, a, however, a consistently defined series. And we are now still missing all kinds of relaxation effects. So occupied, unoccupied mixing, which allows for changes in the density like donor acceptor interactions or internal polarization. Now I go, I summarize that a little bit. Um, I could go into more detail. I want to bring it now more to a general picture. So if we look at a bond formation reaction and delta E is then the bond energy that is always opposed by a little bit of strain, not negligible, but in nine out of 10 cases, not trend determining and an interaction term, which is really important. It's the dominant term. 
and that consists of electrostatic interactions eh? and we can this this is just a general formula where i just include now also nuclear charges into my row just to have a simple picture fragment a and fragment b when they start to overlap they will have stabilizing attraction even if they are two neutral uh, fragments we have all kinds of occupied occupied overlaps and they roughly scale they're roughly proportional to the overlap squared and we have for example things like donor acceptor interactions among others the homo lumo interaction and they are if, if we look to our exact overall algorithm they consist of all pairs of orbital occupied and empty overlapping and the strength is overlap squared divided by the energy gap and so this is a in physics a coupling effect the overlap and a resonance effect the, what we call in chemistry language the energy gap of orbitals now the important thing here is we could do that exactly in cone sham density functional theory as has been shown by Barents already in the 90s by reverse engineering you can get the exact cone sham formalism uh, from a full CI calculation in a complete basis set limit but that is doable only for very small systems and you lose all the practical advantages of DFT namely that it is very efficient and we have very good approximations in density functional theory as Simon already pointed out they are not good for every particular purpose so you carefully need to benchmark and check their performance against accurate ab initio data but it is certainly the case that you can do that very accurately and also describe quite complicated bonding phenomena in a good and proper manner and the important thing here is that it is not only accurate it's no extra uh, approximation on top of your methods um, but that it is of a nature that is disarmingly transparent you know where power repulsion occurs in your within your model namely there where orbitals of filled nature are overlapping from a and between a and b or you get stabilization when an occupied orbital overlaps with an empty orbital but only if the overlap is large and the energy gap is not too big so you can with these simple formulas they are quantitative but you can argue uh, qualitatively so you can and I've summarized that here do the following and now this is my criterion for a good model and not only MO theory obeys this but MO theory does obey this criteria a good model is not only accurate so we need an accurate model that's often not the problem but it also must reveal causalities so within the objects and concepts of the model it must explain why a number gets bigger or smaller. Why is there repulsion or attraction? So mechanisms that explain why. Because only if the model does that, you can use it for understanding and for rational design. Because if it does not do it, you can use it for categorization. It is still, it will still have some use. But you cannot, based on the model, argue what would be a good improvement for a particular purpose. And let's say another model which does that is, for example, valence bond theory. And, valence, and, and there are still other models too. But for me, MO theory and valence bond theory are two very strong uh, models because they contain this causality uh, requirement. They obey that. So they go beyond description and categorization. Now let's bring that to life. And the first example is actually uh, for intermolecular interactions. And I put here already intermolecular covalent interactions because that's the point I'm going to make and this is work um, uh, by a team where the first author was uh, Lucas de Azevedo Santos and let's see what we what we have here so I just explained the normal covalent bond well that will always have electrostatic attraction between the charge distributions it will have Pauli repulsive effects, yeah, closed shell repulsion, actually more precisely repulsion between electrons of same spin. And then finally, we considered, we associated with bonding uh, patterns like an electron pair bond or a donor acceptor bond. That is 
what we normally call a covalent bond. And so a single organic bond or here a donor acceptor bond between a base and, a, and an acid or coordination bond. That is what we normally associate with a covalent chemical bond. And then when we go to intermolecular interactions, weak and strong intermolecular interactions, we often switch to something else. We often look, for example, at the electrostatic potential uh, around uh, the fragment. So this is a strong uh, hydrogen bond, uh, the hydrogen fluoride with fluoride. And what you often see in the literature, well, I, I, I think for FHF minus, the, the, the opinions have already agreed on there is strong covalent uh, um, a strongly covalent uh, mechanism, but still you, you encounter this picture. There is a delta minus on the left fluor, uh, fluoride, a delta plus on the hydrogen, and that attracts the fluoride anion. So we actually look at, and we often take a contour around the density at a certain, well, either covalent or van der Waals distance, and on this plot, the Coulomb potential, the electrostatic potential of the bond donor and the hydrogen fluoride. And then it is said, well, you see here on the electropositive side, there is a positive potential. And here you see the color code uh, for positive potential and negative potential, blue and red. Well, blue on the hydrogen side attracts the fluoride anion. And we can compute indeed a stabilization. So this is the computed um, DFT bond energy at this level. So this is at a, um, a quite sophisticated level and it's in good agreement, yeah, but that's not the point. Of course, it's, it's bound. This picture is then also furthermore uh, ported to other situations of electron rich bonding. Yeah, so this is then the Sigma hole model. That is uh, actually a quite a, a coined concept that is used a lot. And we have that also for halogen bonds, yeah, so chalcogen bonds and pnictogen bonds, where we do not have an element hydrogen bond that's donating to a Lewis base, but an element halogen, element chalcogen, or element pnictogen, yeah, for example, nitrogen or phosphorus. In all these cases, uh, it is quite customary to look at the uh, electron at, at the contour surface around the electron density onto which we plot the electrostatic potential. Yeah? And at this positive side, we ad identify a maximum positive potential in along the bonding axis, which is indeed there, so there's no discussion about that, which has a certain positive value. Yeah? And here it's in kcal per mole per unit charge. Chalcogen bond and nitrogen bond and we see compared to the hydrogen bond that there's a dramatic drop in positive potential if we go from hydrogen bonds to well the heavier atom bonds eh, where we have elements halogen chalcogen or pnictogen so based on that the sigma hole would predict a weakening of the bond from hydrogen to heavier uh, bond donors which we do not see. We see a strengthening. And so we see, for example, here 45.8 for the hydrogen bond. And if we replace hydrogen by chlorine, it becomes 52. Then it fluctuates a little bit, but it's in all cases stronger than the hydrogen bond. So that is not in agreement with what a simple sigma hole electrostatic picture would tell us. And in this way, the sigma hole model is is flawed. Eh? It's just not predicting what we compute or measure. So what is going on? Well, let's, let's look from the perspective of a quantitative MO picture, eh, which yields by definition accurate values. You can always argue about, do I find that a clear model or not? But you cannot argue about its accuracy. It's just as accurate as the quantum mechanical compute engine that you're using. So, now, I, this is not a reaction curve that I show, but I just show you the different energy terms um, along the line so that you can see how important they are with respect to each other. And so we start with separate uh, fragments, uh, the sulfur fluoride and the fluoride ion. 
And finally, they form a chalcogen complex, which is bound by about 50 kcal per mole. Now, how much strain is there in the fragments? Well, the strain can only come from the sulfur fluoride. It is about 16 kcal per mole, which has to do with the lengthening of the sulfur fluoride bond when it starts to interact with the fluoride. The electrostatic interaction is significant, so there's definitely a lot of electrostatic interaction between the charge distributions of the two fragments, and that is um, bringing it down to, to a considerable stability. But there's, of course, uh, different terms contributing to that. So we have repulsion between the nuclei of the two fragments, repulsion between the charge distributions, but also attraction between charge distribution of one fragment and nuclei of the other fragment. And that's the exact electrostatic interaction if you would bring the unperturbed systems to their chemical bond distance. But of course, they will react. There is the Pauli principle, which is causing a significant destabilization. So if it would be only for electrostatic strain and Pauli principle, uh, we would have no bond. Uh, we need, in addition, the orbital interactions, the relaxation terms, which bring the system again down to a stabilizing value of minus 50.1 kcal per mole. And if we look into the mechanisms, the features in the electronic structure of the wave function behind the density, then what we see is that the main effect causing stabilization is the donation, and also Simon mentioned that already, of the lone pair of the base into the sigma star orbital of the Fs bond. That is the main contribution. And we can, so here you see the orbitals, the occupied orbital in hard colors, and in more pastel colors, you see the unoccupied orbital, so just that you can distinguish between them. And if you look at the deformation density, so the density of the final complex minus the densities of the fragments, and that is something, if you could make crystals, now I would look to Simon, how can you do that? Probably difficult for an anionic complex. But if you would measure the densities, you can compute, but also measure the deformation density, then you see that indeed the deformation density just looks like the homo-lumo interaction. Depletion on the fluoride P level and accumulation in blue, where you have the sigma star on the other side. So really exactly in line with the MO picture, which is also nice for the MO picture because it gets back up from a density picture. And that's why it is so nice to look with different um, methods at chemical bonding. So back to the chalcogen bond, we can also say let's put different substituents on the bond donor. Eh? So it's still a chalcogen bond donor, a sulfur bond donor, but we go from fluorine to chlorine as substituents. And here you see the picture that you would expect for the um, sigma hole model. Eh? You have the positive end on the sulfur, 48.6 um, kcal per mole per unit charge at the, at the uh, a sigma hole, the, the most positive part of the density, we go down to 34.7. If we have the much less polar bond when we have chlorine here, makes sense, the bond is really less polar. But now if we look at the bond strength for the fluorine S, it is 50 kcal per mole. For chlorine S, 53. It doesn't become significantly weaker. No, it becomes stronger. And if we look why that is so, it's certainly not simply the electrostatics, it's really the orbital interactions, the donor acceptor interaction, which becomes much more stabilizing from fluorine S to chlorine S. And the reason is that this donor acceptor interaction becomes stronger because the sigma star orbital in the uh, chlorine sulfur sigma star is a little bit lower because the bond is longer and chlorine is bigger bond is longer, the bond overlap is smaller, and therefore also the antibonding sigma star is less destabilized, is lower, and the smaller homo-lumo gap makes the orbital interactions for chlorine sulfur stronger, and therefore the bond becomes not weaker, but stronger. 
And this is actually, I will wrap that up. This is so for all kinds of similar bonds. And I've called them here electron rich hypervalent. And if you want to be uh, strict on terminology, I saw that Simon is very strict. You could call it also electron rich hyper coordinate. Yeah, for me, that is no problem. Um, I, uh, I associate hypervalence, by the way, not with violating the octet shell, but with really being able to form more bonds than you would based on the simple octet rule um, expect. Yeah, but let's let's call it also hypercoordinate in this system. So electron rich hypercoordinate systems. In all cases, we have a sigma star, have a pnictogen, chalcogen, halogen, and hydrogen bonds, the sigma star orbital, and the base uh, a homo or lone pair donates charge into the sigma star and causes homo lumo stabilization, quite general and very important, a very dominant term, uh, which is anyway uh, responsible in most cases for trends in stability. But of course, the electrostatics are also important for the overall stability. Now I want to focus on some, on some inconsistencies in the sigma whole model because in certain subcommunities the sigma model is so popular, but it is really, it is not necessary to use it and it is really sometimes misleading and I discourage you to use it. And I will show you here why. And so I showed you also some inconsistencies already before, but look again here with hydrogen, halogen, chalcogen, pnictogen bonds, sigma whole model becomes less positive, stability becomes more um, stable. And so that runs counter. That was because of the orbital interactions. Now we could wonder, maybe for the electrostatics, the sigma whole model is still okay. But now if we, yeah, so the heavier acceptor forms not uh, stronger, not weaker bonds. So electrostatics also become stronger, not less stabilizing, but more stabilizing, despite the fact that the sigma whole potential becomes less positive. So you would expect less interaction. Well, what is wrong about this model is the following. Eh? What we really have is actually 3D charge distributions that interact with each other. And also the base is not a point charge, but a 3D charge distribution with electron charge, but also with nuclei. And if we go from hydrogen bonds to pnictogen bonds, actually the effective charge distribution somewhat more includes the nuclei of the Lewis base, which is therefore stabilized much more significantly than when this nucleus lies outside the charge distribution. That is one of the premier reasons why we get this extra stabilization from the left to the right. So what we, and, and now uh, the, the following point is the directionality. Yeah? So if we have the uh, a chalcogen bond as an example, yeah? and we have here F, sulfur forming a complex with fluoride. Here we look on top of the molecular plane. Here we look sideways to the molecular plane. And we know that the fluoride and the bond acceptor will not be in a stable configuration when it moves out of the plane and to say 90% bend. And so when you bend it, it doesn't matter if it is 90% or less, uh, just bending it away from planarity is unfavorable. The sigma whole model says that is because you lose this electrostatic stabilization. But if we look, yeah, so the energy of the system indeed goes up if you bend it to 90 degrees, uh, really significantly, minus 50 to plus 29.7. If you look at the electrostatic interaction, that goes down. And that is again, so it's not becoming less stabilizing, it, it's becoming more stabilizing. And the reason is, as I told you, the bond acceptor is not a point charge. Yeah? And the bond donor is not just a service, it's a 3D distribution that holds for both parties, both fragments. So again, here, what happens is the base is here, here, so we have here a consistent ISO density surface. You could choose them wherever you want. Here it's chosen such that it just touches the fluoride on one side. And I have now an isodistant bending. I bend it upwards and you see 
there's this torus of charge, this broadening around the fluoride, and the bond acceptor just dives a little bit into this pi charge density of the bond donor. And that causes the extra electrostatic stabilization. That's why the total electrostatic interaction becomes more stabilizing. So why does the energy go up? Well, um, we come to that, but let's first look what is wrong about the sigma hole model. The sigma hole model is wrong because it considers, it makes you think about the base and the, the bond acceptor as a point charge. If it were a point charge, and that is what I plot here, and you bend it upwards, then the electrostatic interaction between bond donor and point charge bond acceptor would go up. Yes, because you go from a positive to a more negative region on the isosurface. And of course, then it becomes less stabilizing, but it is not a point charge. So what is really causing the, yeah, the, the opposition to bending? Well, that is actually the Pauli term, which goes up dramatically. Yeah, it is also there in the linear complex. There's always closed shell overlap, but somehow the closed shell overlap becomes much more severe if we go to the bent configuration. And if you look in the bonding mechanism, it is actually very simple. The lone pair of the base in the linear configuration has zero overlap with the lone pair, yeah, the canonical lone pair on the bond donor. That's such a fluoride, yeah, uh, perpendicular or fluorine p orbital. Yeah? And here it has plus and minus overlap. It cancels to exactly zero. But if I move it to the bent situation, there is sizable overlap. And here it's drawn in a bonding manner, but there's of course also the anti-bonding configuration or a combination, and that is what's causing this destabilization. Simply closed shell overlap. So the conclusion for this part is actually intermolecular interactions, I should say electron-rich intermolecular interactions. So when some closed shell molecule comes close to a bond with a low sigma star orbital, they are all similar, weak and strong ones. I showed you here strong interactions, but it also holds for neutral um, bases, but then just all energy terms are just smaller, it's just more weakly bound. They always have an important electrostatic component, but often the trend determining composition uh, 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 contribution is the orbital interaction. And without the orbital interaction, the system would not even be bound in most cases. The sigma hole model, still quite popular, is unphysical and misleading. And the reason why it goes wrong, it's, it's actually an elegant model. In, in a sense, I like it. It's just wrong because it belongs to a picture in which the bond acceptor is a point charge. And it is nothing but a point charge. It's a 3D object. And that makes the whole thing completely different. And finally, an appropriate name or designation for these electron-rich interactions would therefore be intermolecular covalent interactions, or if you want, just intermolecular interactions, but certainly not non-covalent interactions. That is a very common term. I'm actually sometimes pessimistic that it disappears because it is, has become so common, but it is not in agreement with the nature of these bonds. And so I would prefer intermolecular interactions, but an appropriate and really to the point designation is intermolecular covalent interactions. And now I, if time permits, yes, I think I have some time, I want to make the step. So how does that compare to conventional covalent interactions? And this is work by Eva Blocker and a team of the group. And what we looked at is actually trends across the periodic table, single bonds, between second and third period elements X and Y saturated with hydrogen. And what do we mean by strength? We mean the uh, homolytic bond dissociation energy, uh, which you normally get by heating enough. You, you can look at enthalpy or electronic energy. They all give the same trends. So what did we look at? Well, this is computed trends. You see a 3D bar diagram in which the vertical axis is the 
um, homolytic bond dissociation enthalpy. And on the X and the Y axis, you see the fragments which are combining or dissociating. And so you can, for example, if I co combine CH3 with CH3, I get here the CC bond. But the nice thing is I ordered these fragments according to their polling or whatever electronegativity, that's all the same trend. And what you see is, of course, what you learn in physical organic chemistry. For example, here I have fluorine uh, radical combining with fluorine, hydroxy, chlorine, and so on, till silyl radical. And so the second and the third period um, hydride radicals. And you see that the more electronegativity, uh, the bigger the electronegativity difference, the stronger the bond. Not entirely systematic, but quite systematic. There are sometimes little wiggles, which we can also discuss. I will not do that today. But by and large, and that's also called the electronegativity model, that tells you if a bond has a larger electronegativity difference, it is stronger. And in MO language, electronegativity is, of course, related to orbital energy. Um, and then if we look in particular to electron pair bonding, it's the difference between the soma of the more electropositive and the soma of the more electronegative, a singly occupied MO of the more electronegative fragment. For example, uh, CH3 and fluorine. And so where does the trend come from? Well, here I show carbon, so the, the methyl radical forming an electron pair bond with either fluorine or iodine. And then the idea is fluorine is more electronegative. It has a lower energy for its soma, which it really has. So the stabilization of this electron in the electropositive fragment by just by dropping down, even if there would not even be uh, stabilization by overlap, just dropping down into the lower energy uh, SOMO gives more stabilization than dropping in a less negative energy SOMO, which you have for iodine. And that makes the CF bond stronger than the CI bond. And we want to look at that in a bit more detail. I've actually data for you for all the combinations shown on this 3D bar diagram but I will now focus on the CF and the CCL bond. And let's first look here at the orbital energy gap between the electropositive and electronegative fragment SOMO. Um, and I'm looking here as a function of the bond distance. Everything we are doing here, we are looking at this as a function of the bond distance. And we will compare the CF bond in green and the CCL bond in blue. So green data, CF, blue data, CCL. And this is the qualitative MO interaction diagram, which matches indeed qualitatively also the quantitative M Koncham MO diagram. And let's first look at the CF bond. The orbital energy gap is indeed quite big, which is good for the stability, and it is much smaller for the CCL bond. And you see, by the way, that the gap the orbital energy gap is a function of the bond length. And the reason for that is that during bond formation, when the bond gets shorter, the methyl radical uh, becomes pyramidal and the SOMO goes actually a little bit down in energy, um, which makes the gap to the electronegative fragment smaller. And so this, is, this reduction in the gap at shorter bond distance is a result of methyl radical becoming pyramidal upon bond formation. So that's the energy gap. So according to the energy gap, yeah, it's very clear. The CF bond is stronger because it's uh, because it has a larger energy gap here in green. But what about the overlap, which is also important for this part of the stabilization and the lowering of the bonding orbital with respect to this lower energy fragment MO? And then if we have here on the right side axis the value of the bond overlap. And again, green and blue for fluorine and chlorine system. And here is the bond overlap for the CF bond in green. And here for CCL. And it is actually, as you see, much larger. So if that mechanism, the lowering of the bonding combination with respect to the lower energy SOMO would become 
the dominant cause of stabilization, the CCL bond should be stronger because of a better overlap. Well, we know it is not stronger, eh? but the overlap is better for the CCL bond. And by the way, that's easy to understand eh? because here you see the SOMO of the methyl radical, eh? which is well derived from a carbon 2P. If I go from carbon uh, along the second period to fluorine, the 2P orbital becomes much more compact. It's contracted due to the higher nuclear charge. And therefore, there is an orbital mismatch in the shape. It can never reach an optimal overlap because fluorine is simply too small to overlap all its amplitude with all the amplitude on the carbon side. But if we go from fluorine down one period, so to the next principal quantum number, we have again more extended lobes and they match actually in spatial extension better with the carbon. So now we have a better overlap and that's what you see here. So better overlap in the bond overlap in the CCL bond. Well, which of the two factors is now dominant? Eh? Because in, if you have semi-quantitative or purely quantitative MO theory, you can now wonder, yeah, I see that the overlap is in favor of the CCL bond, but the orbital energy gap is in favor of the CF bond. Which one is dominant? And there will be a surprising result. And we look here, and now we use this energy decomposition analysis, uh, which I want to emphasize is not a model on its own. It is only a quantification of mechanisms that take place in the MO bonding mechanism. And so the model is MO theory, and our EDA method is just a tool to quantify the features in the Koncham MO bonding mechanism. So positive and negative energies, here's the zero. And on the uh, horizontal axis, we have the bond distance. So we do a bond anal analysis now for CF and CCL along the bond distance. So for different bond distances. And here you have the total interaction for CF and here for CCL, nothing unexpected. We already know that the CF bond has its minimum at a shorter distance than the C, uh, CL bond, which has a longer bond distance. And we know that the CF minimum is at lower energy than the CCL one. So nothing unexpected, nothing explained. It's just correct. We look now first at orbital interactions. And in green, you have the CF. And we always have assumed the orbital interactions are more stabilizing for CF because of the larger energy gap. The electron of, of the carbon fragment drops lower into the low energy fluorine. But now what we see is that the CCL bo orbital, bonding orbital interactions are at any given bond distance more stabilizing than the, the ones for CF. So CCL has actually more favorable orbital interactions. So apparently the overlap, and that makes sense in a, uh, if you consider it, which goes quadratically, has outperformed the one over delta epsilon term. And that can happen. That is something for, for this you need to do a quantitative calculation to see which of the two is more important. But that's an interesting outcome. So why then is the CF bond stronger than the CCL bond? Well, let's look at electrostatic interactions. CF, CCL, it's again more stabilizing for CCL. And the reason is chlorine has more electrons. They receive more stabilization from the carbon cloud or the methyl electron cloud and vice versa, a larger electrostatic attraction of the methyl electrons by the higher nuclear charge of chlorine. Always comparing the energy with the starting uh, fragments. So that is also not the reason, but the reason turns out the Pauli repulsion. If we look at the CF Pauli repulsion, you see here the green curve, and now that really goes dramatically up for CCL. And if we inspect which orbital interactions are responsible for that, and which Pauli repulsive orbital interactions, closed shell, closed shell, then what we see is there is two important reasons. The Pauli repulsion starts earlier for the CCL bond because chlorine has larger outer valence orbitals, 
but it anyway becomes much larger because chlorine has more occupied shells than fluorine. So that generates automatically at any given distance more uh, Pauli repulsion, more closed shell orbital repulsion. And that is what in MO language actually is effective atomic size. So simply because chlorine is bigger than fluorine, it will give you much more closed shell repulsion at any given distance that pushes the optimum here in faded out blue to a longer distance than for fluorine, longer equilibrium distance. And it also makes the bond weaker. Although the, the orbital interactions at any given distance are better, more stabilizing for CCL, but not at the respective optimum geometries. And so if I look at the minimum here, the orbital interaction for, um, I have to look more precisely here for blue is here, um, uh, at, at this value, well, I, I don't know, I cannot exactly see the value, but if I compare it to the CF orbital interactions at their equilibrium distance here, they are more stabilizing at the equilibrium distance, but at any given distance, they are less stabilizing than for CCL. And so the C CL bond is really longer and weaker because of the extra Pauli repulsion which makes uh, that we have this situation. So in summary, down a group, uh, so if we go from CF to CCL, and this continues for CBR, uh, C bromine and C iodine, it is the increasing atom size that weakens the bond. So the electronegativity model breaks down and we can quantify these terms in quantitative MO theory. But the funny thing, I didn't show you the data, the electronegativity model is not always wrong. It is sometimes also correct. For example, if we go from CF to CO, CN, CC bond, then it is not the atomic size, but really the electronegativity difference, so the effective SOMO energy, that is responsible for weakening the bond. And so in this case, the old electronegativity model is just correct. But the ironic thing is that for the carbon halogen bonds, which are always used to illustrate the electronegativity model in nearly all physical organic chemistry textbooks, for that example, the model is actually wrong. But in some other cases, it is correct. That brings me to the end. So more in general, um, I think you need accuracy and causality. Uh, for example, in my case, the quantitative MO model. A quantitative MO model can be very accurate if chosen well. Um, by the way, I would like to remark that it, in, if well chosen, it really easily outperforms MP2. MP2 is not at all a benchmark to which you should compare. If you want to have a good benchmark, you could, for example, depending on the type of interaction, go to a highly correlated couple cluster level, for example, triple or quadruple excitations included, and you go, of course, to the complete basis set error. That is a reasonable benchmark. MP2 is in many cases not at all. So an accurate model, but more importantly, there are a lot of accurate models Important is that it contains causality. So it constitutes a universe of discourse yeah, and a kind of cosmos with concepts yeah, like what a physical model is. So how should we consider phenomena? And within that cosmos, it provides you causal mechanisms. It can explain why it computes large or small numbers. Secondly, intermolecular interactions are certainly for electron-rich interactions, intermolecular covalent interactions, and certainly not non-covalent interactions. And what I also tried to explain is that the sigma whole model is actually um, unphysical. And it is because one of the two fragments is not a point charge, while the sigma whole model treats one of the two fragments as a point charge. That is really just not the right physics. And finally, Sterics, and that is what I showed you in the final situations, sterics like atom size 
are often underexposed, underexposed in current models, in current physical models of uh, chemical bonding. I would like to uh, end by uh, thanking, well, in the first place, the two people who were involved in the two examples, Lucas and Eva, also my direct colleagues, uh, Celia, Trevor, and Pascal, and the whole group for contributing um, to our research and pleasant atmosphere. I thank you for your uh, attention. I should also thank our funding agencies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very clear uh, and excellent uh, lecture. Uh, which is now uh, open for comments and questions. And uh, before the first questions appear, let me ask uh, my question. As I understand, you have shown us uh, results for isolated uh, moieties. How would this change if you embed this into uh, crystal lattices uh, full of, uh, uh, of different symmetry? Would, would this change this, this picture you were showing us? Yeah. Um, yeah. In, 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 uh, when I uh, remain really very general, there are actually two situations you have to distinguish. A local bonding within a crystal. And so if you embed particular model, molecular model systems in, a, in an environment, yeah, uh, things are still very similar. But it is relatively, uh, you, you need a few tricks to isolate the local interaction from the environment. Eh? And there are different ways to do that. Uh, one way is um, actually a, book, a bookkeeping that you can do if you take your environment as a discrete environment. Then you would have to look at an environment in which you have a cavity with one fragment or the other fragment and the combined molecule which allows you to look at the bonding mechanism. That is quite involved and for larger systems, quite expensive, but you can do it. A more affordable way of doing that is an effective medium, which is, of course, for a crystalline environment, not very accurate, but in certain solvent situations, if you look at solvation effects, it is for many situations quite good because by the lucky coincidence that the effective medium um, looks very similar to a time averaged um, uh, analysis of a discrete uh, a solvent with its dynamics. Uh, the dynamics make that the cavity in a real solvent on average, if you have a time average, looks very similar. It's of course not the same, but looks very similar to the cavity in a continuum. Um, and that gives often very good results, but it completely breaks down if you have strong solvent solute interactions. And for that, you need this discrete approach. Another general answer is if you look at interactions between, um, let's say, infinite fragments. So if you would look at layers or interpenetrating features in overall crystal, or you look, for example, at surfaces interacting with... Um, uh, yeah, large numbers of, yeah, let's say, for example, molecules and uh, that, that, that are uh, sub, uh, subject to a catalytic um, yeah, transformation, then you can do very similar things, but then you have infinite um, fragments with a translational symmetry. And that is done by, by several people, but very famous examples are, for example, the extended Huckel uh, approaches of Roald Hoffmann. And so yeah. they are the so the extended hookles may be not so accurate, but the concepts and the mechanisms in extended hookle are very similar to what you get with uh, state of the art quantitative methods. So the understanding that you get with extended hookle is not so much affected by the accuracy of the extended hookle. Thank you, thank you very much, Paulina. Can you read the question? Yeah, we have a question from Florian Clemens. Thank you very much for a very nice and didactical, well-made talk. Uh, regarding part three, are you aware of any attempts to correlate, maybe even semi-quantitatively, the Pearson principle properties with the ratio of EDA contributions and uh, the contained relation between steric features and electrostatic behavior of chemical functional groups ligands? Uh, if no, do you think it would be feasible? 
Yeah, that's a very good uh, question. So that is actually making a connection to the hard soft uh, as a base uh, theory. And um, yeah, that, that has actually uh, proven to be a quite useful uh, theory. And it's actually a special case of a more general uh, conceptual framework given by conceptual DFT and where it is part of. And uh, yeah, we have good connections to um, yeah, the Brussels group, uh, our Freie Universiteit, sister university in uh, Belgium, um, at least in name, uh, to the Geerlings and uh, the Proft uh, groups. They, they uh, mainly use conceptual DFT, but we have overlapping interests and you can connect the two. Eh? So there is, of course, the simple connections where you uh, correlate homo-lumo gaps with hardness uh, or softness, but you can extend that formalism and you can show that the two approaches are ultimately equivalent, but of course they do take very different perspectives, yeah, but they do not rule each other out. They are just different views on the same quantum mechanical overall formalism. And um, th there I want to stress again what, um, what Simon already said. Um, it can be very valuable to look from these different perspectives. And you can very well have your own favorite perspective. And by perspective now, I, I mean quantum mechanical model of bonding, MO, valence bond, conceptual DFT. There's also topological methods and, and NBO. All have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, uh, I, I think this is, uh, the, the question is so good because especially for conceptual DFT, there are very direct connections between MO and, and CDFT. Yeah. So yes, yes, this is very well possible. And that's also done, for example, by Frank de Proft. Uh, while some other people are writing, I have my own question. Uh, I'm more familiar with uh, ACPT, Symmetry Adapted Perturbation Theory, to analyze intermolecular interactions. Mm -hmm. And it, it is somehow similar to MEO model. At least the beginning is the same, right? Mm -hmm. Electrostatic and Pauli repulsion. But then we have uh, polarization uh, and dispersion. How this compares to orbital interactions? Yeah. Can we somehow yeah, that's actually well, a very, uh, very good question. There is actually a um, publication of Pavel Hopsa and Celia von Seke-Guerre in which they direct, I've, I've forgotten now of which year, um, uh, I, I could send it to you later on, uh, but you will find it if you look for Hopsa and von Seke-Guerre, mm -hmm. um, where they compared the EDA, uh, so the energy decomposition that belongs to the MO picture, with the uh, the SUPT approach, uh, which is uh, based on a on perturbation theory. And what they show is that for, uh, for intermolecular interactions, uh, I think they used it for hydrogen bonds, uh, they give uh, very similar values and anyway the same trends. And the reason is, of course, they are, if you look at the algorithm, they are not identical but similar. So the electrostatics is the same. Uh, uh, overlap repulsion or exchange repulsion or Pauli repulsion, they are actually the same. And the differences occur later on. They also occur because uh, SAPT is, is a perturbation theory approach. So the mathematical formalism only holds for small interactions. If they become too strong, the math breaks down. But for weak interactions, uh, SAPT and EDA work the same, they give the same trends and very similar results. Um, but the stronger the interaction, the more they deviate. But that is because SAPT is not applicable to strong interactions, while EDA is. It's just, it is within the MO model, um, it is exact. So the only error is because of the functional that you use, but not because of the analysis method on top of it. So you must say that EDA is more general. Absolutely. EDA you can use for mm -hmm. strong covalent bonds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we have already a link to that paper you mentioned mm -hmm. on the yeah. chat. Uh, and Hans Bitbergi, uh, consider. Uh, thank you, thank you, Trevor, for providing the link. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and from Hans Bitbergi, uh, consider CH3CN BF3. 
in the gas phase, uh, distance, distance, I am guessing, is distance uh, Bn is uh, 2 angstrom. In the crystal, it's 1.6 angstrom. It seems that the crystal field is much more important than the properties of fragments. Yeah. Um, I, I have to admit that I do not know exactly the potential energy surface of this uh, complex. I think it is, uh, compared to the systems I've shown today, it is a much more weakly bound complex uh, because the Lewis base, uh, uh, CH3CN, is a much weaker base than, uh, than halide ions. So I believe that the potential energy surface is more shallow and therefore packing effects will anyway be much more important if you put that into the crystal. Um, I think the effects would become smaller for stronger bases, but except for packing, there's another effect, and that is what does the environment do to the bonding capability? Well, very often it weakens the bonding. For example, if it stabilizes the uh, HOMO of the base, it will make the complex even weaker and therefore the bond longer. That could also be the case here, but I don't know the crystal. Uh, I don't know if it is just the substance itself. Uh, it, if that is the case, I, I, I assume that for the moment, then it could be that the environment will make the uh, Lewis base a even weaker base, and also for that reason, um, uh, um, yeah, affect the distance. But if I look at what the effect is, it's a shortening. So I think it is. It will probably be rather a, a packing effect than that, because a weakening would not make the bond shorter. We have next uh, question from Bogdan Lessing regarding uh, causal interpretation. Uh, you didn't try to use the Bader's uh, atoms in molecule model, including the viral uh, theorem. Is, this, uh, is it useless in this case? Yeah, I would say useless is maybe a bit um, uh, re respectless formulation, but uh, I do indeed believe that uh, the Bader atoms in molecules theory as such um, lacks causality. Yeah, so it's typically a method that is, so if you, if you just compute topological properties of a certain fragment, uh, it, you have no clue about how it will behave in the vicinity of another fragment. So it does not have this causal power that gives this predictive power. Um, I know that there are extensions in the topological world uh, which try to, to, uh, to make, to remedy this, this. So for example, interacting quantum atoms of uh, Angel Martin Pendas, I think is a substantial improvement. Um, but the atoms in molecules uh, theory of Bader is uh, is just lacking this. So in that respect, uh, I uh, I would not recommend it. It's also very uh, computationally expensive. You need numerical approaches, and you well you can categorize systems based on that, but you cannot explain anything. I, I would discourage people to use it if you want to do topological. Uh, approaches, uh, for example, then in that case, uh, it's better to go to uh, interacting quantum atoms. And and I personally, so but that's my my taste. I would go to MO theory or or valence bond. Uh, so valence bond fits a bit less naturally with uh, DFT, but you can also do it if you want with DFT. Uh, but um, well, in that case, uh, you you can just use uh, regular wave function theory. I find it also a very good model, but um, I have a personal preference for MO. I think it's it's easier in the end to explain something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Samuel T. Teeth, uh, did you consider different spin states in your model? Uh, yeah, not, not in these particular examples, but in similar examples. So for example, uh, you you can have uh, in multiple bonds you can have often different spin states and also in metals you can have different spin states and that will definitely change their bonding behavior and that corresponds to what you see in experiments so if you excite fragments if you excite them to different spin states they will behave differently so the spin state 
matters. And to give you a very trivial example, if you would have two fragments, let's say, make it as simple as possible, two hydrogens which approach each other with same spin, they will not bind. They will just be repulsive. And if they have opposite spin, so the overall system can change between uh, different overall spin, they will become bound. And that shows you how dramatically the bonding behavior depends on the spin state. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, Simon, Paulina, do you, I do not see anybody writing. Uh, and how about you? Do you have your questions? Yeah, could I ask a question? I was trying yeah. to figure out how to write in the chat, but I don't see how to do it. Uh, <laughs> um, this is a, I ask it towards the end now, it's a more general or even philosophical question, but I would be interested to get your opinion on that. Mm -hmm. I think with many of these uh, models and explanations, if we, like you did now, really didactically go through it, explain it, I think uh, there are very little doubts or very little um, problems, but sometimes we have semantic problems or problems of definition. Mm -hmm. Just for example, what uh, you call hypervalent, I call hypercoordinated. Mm -hmm. And if we just, you know, write a one sentence about it, we would maybe talk about opposite effects. But if we just talk about it, it's the mm -hmm. same thing. So how, and I think we have that problem also in quantum crystallography that we have many terms that are used in different ways, even your example of non-covalent interactions, which I think many of us use the term, but we, we don't believe that it's only non-covalent interactions. Mm -hmm. So how would you, what's your take on definition and semantics? And, and yeah. is there... Yeah, that, I, I think uh, that that's in all of science important. And I have the impression, especially in theoretical chemistry, you can sometimes have religious fights uh, and later find out that you actually agree, but just use different language. Yeah, um, yeah so I think the hyper-coordinate and hyper-valent uh, are probably the easiest problem, but it's a problem uh, because if we talk about it, we find out that we actually mean the same thing. But a more, uh, a more uh, complicated and a deeper problem is as exactly when you use different models. And as you said, there is not right or wrong model. Um, but I would say there are useful and less useful models. And just one, one comparison, one general comparison. If you look uh, just in the old times uh, when, uh, when uh, mankind uh, thought that uh, the center of the universe is the Earth and the sun rotates around the Earth, and later we corrected that, uh, well, in the solar system, the Earth rotates around the sun and that makes, um, well, that, that is what we now, uh, uh, of course, know. However, the old picture is in a sense not wrong. It is just leading to a very complicated description of all the motions you are seeing. Of course, you can put the origin of your coordinate system into the Earth. Yeah, and then, yeah, the sun rotation will be simple, but all other uh, planets uh, of the solar system will make complicated motions and putting the sun in the center leads to a much easier description of the solar system. So I would say both models are in a sense correct, but taking the sun as the center leads to a much more transparent description. And that is what you sometimes also have with chemical bonding models. There are different models um, which, well, if you if they have, if they are quantitative models, they can add up to the same total energy and the same structure, but they look very different. And then the question is just, do these models make it easier for me to understand what's going on or not? And partially that's a matter of taste, but partially it's also a matter of what did I learn first and I'm used to a certain method and find it difficult to give that up and switch to a different method. Uh, which is very human eh, to, to have. Both problems are, are there. And the third problem is once you have different good models, eh, they, they are just a way of understanding nature, then you have objects in these methods, like uh, these basins in, uh, in uh, 
electron localization function theory, which you can coordinate, which you can um, associate with bonding pairs or lone pairs. However, they are not canonical orbitals. So you call them <laughs> electron pair or lone pair, but they are not the object that you would need, for example, to compute an ionization energy or that you would use in perturbation theory to look at orbital interactions. But within ELF, they have their function. But if you call them electron pair or lone pair, that is where it becomes dangerous because then uh, these objects are actually, they, they mean something very different than an MO lone pair. And let's say the user of theories, they, they would consider it, oh, that, that, that's my bonding MO, which it is not. And so that, that's the danger of having objects that look similar, but are really something completely different. And so that's the, so you have just uh, agreeing on the same words for the same thing, agreeing on what you find useful uh, or not. And then finally being aware that similarly, similar appearances of objects in one uh, model are not one-to-one -one, uh, uh, related to objects which look similar in another model. And that's the third thing you should be aware of to avoid misunderstandings. Thank you very much. Yeah. That was excellent. I, I have, by the way, also one question uh, to you. Uh, so uh, talking about uh, ELF and the, and the hyper-coordinate systems. So um, with ELF, uh, for example, or, or another method, how would you then um, explain that uh, carbon does not form uh, a regular hyper-coordinate um, uh, configuration like, uh, let's say, if, if chloride attacks chloromethane, uh, the trigonal bipyramid is not a minimum but a saddle point. But if chloride attacks chlorosilane, the trigonal bipyramid uh, is a stable, well, let's call it hypercoordinate system. How would you explain that in, uh, in ELF theory? Um... So the, the way that I use or understand uh, theory is basically like a counting rule only. You know, you have a, um, a fixed uh, a geometry and then it's a post-mortem analysis of, it's a counting rule, mm -hmm. uh, how you ascribe electrons to a certain region and space. Yeah, so it's not, uh, it's not, so it's what you say is it's not, let's say, relating to an expression within ELF, which tells you what the energy or stability is. I wouldn't know how that is yeah. done. Yeah. But, but how then, so if you go from, um, now I take a very, very particular system, um, try cyano uh, chloromethane. So a carbon with a chlorine and three CN groups. Yeah. If you add to that uh, a second chloride, you get the, the trigonal bipyramid is not hyper coordinate. It will not be stable. It will localize one bond and elongate the other CCL bond. But now instead of going to a more electronegative halogen, which well should pull away density from the central atom and therefore make it uh, so avoid the violation of the octet rule. I go to astatine, well, very unpleasant in experiments. You can also go down to iodine, that also works. So you have iodine, carbon, iodine, and in the equatorial plane, three cyano substituents. That system is hypercoordinate. It is stable as a trigonal bipyramid, while the halogen that you have now chosen allows for more charge going to the central atom. So that would actually be a against the counting rule. Do you know what the, 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 the count electron count would be? That well, would be I don't know the number, but I know that the charge distribution would shift from the halogen towards the central atom the current, if yeah. you go from a more electronegative to a more electropositive halogen or less yeah. electronegative. Yeah. I think that's that's clear, but I think the electron count would then so would certainly increase, right? For for, for the yeah. carbon. Yeah. So, but why then does it become hypercoordinate? I 
Aha, okay. So mm -hmm. you're saying if, okay, I understand what you're saying. So if that counting rule or Durant's counting rule, if we take that one, um, would be predictive with respect to the geometry, then such situation couldn't exist. Um, yeah, okay, that's, that's of course uh, a valid point. I would be interested to actually do it and, and see how many electrons yeah, are yeah. I, I would also be interested. Yeah. Florian is helping us. Wouldn't the secondary interaction between iodine and CN orbitals interfere uh, since uh, iodine is so much bigger? Yeah, uh, indeed. Um, uh, there is a secondary interaction. Um, actually, it becomes more stabilizing in the case of um, chlorine because the, the chloride benefits more from the delocalization of the um, charge on carbon into the pi star orbitals of CN. And iodine also benefits from that, but less. Yeah. Mat Matthias. We, we see in, in crystal lattice of uh, uh, fluoride, which is calcium um, uh, F2 uh, crystal, a second, uh, uh, secondary um, interaction between flu uh, fluorine uh, and ions. Uh, onset of this interaction, very, uh, very nice, uh, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Um, yeah. Anyway, I have enjoyed this uh, a lot. Uh, yeah. So thanks uh, to the organizers and also the other speaker. Yeah. Uh, we, the audience, it has been a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, uh, Simon, Matthias, thank you very much for both great, great lectures and for this great discussions.